Welcome back, everyone, to your weekly Space News Roundup with me. We've got a bunch of stuff to cover regarding Starship, antics aboard the International Space Station, and some launch news from places all across the world, and a whole bunch more. So let's not dilly-dally too long in the intro and move along to the topic that I usually start these videos with, all the latest news regarding SpaceX's Starship development. SpaceX are speed, or in Elon's words, moving at warp 9, as the final phases of construction commence ahead of the first orbital flight of Starship. Where to even begin? I guess we can start with Booster 3, which is the main vehicle we've had our eyes trained on ever since it was moved out to Test Stand A at the beginning of July. This prototype sailed through pressure and cryo testing, and of course we saw a full test duration static fire with three Raptor engines on the 19th of July. In last week's episode, I mentioned that Elon had tweeted about the possibility of a nine-engine static fire on the prototype, although with the booster still sitting there without any engines at all, I'd say any further testing out of this thing is unlikely, especially given how close Booster 4 is. Look at Brendan Lewis's latest overview diagram. Every segment is accounted for, and stacking is rapidly underway inside the high bay. In fact, the only thing that needs to happen is the joining of the methane and liquid oxygen tanks. As of the 30th of July, the liquid oxygen section of Booster 4 was completed, and stacking of the methane tank, which of course will sit on top of the liquid oxygen segment, began. And frankly, who knows, it might now have been stacked on top of the liquid oxygen tank by the time this video is live, given the rapid speed that SpaceX have been moving at these past few days, completing the booster. Right now, on the 1st of August I'm recording this, this hasn't happened yet. One of the more interesting developments we saw with Booster 4 was the confirmation that the grid fins on Booster 4 won't fold. If you're familiar with Falcon 9, you'll be aware that the grid fins for the first stage are folded up for takeoff and stage separation, and they then unfold and, you know, deploy when it comes time to make the controlled descent down to either the drone ship or the landing zone. Interestingly, this isn't going to be the case for Booster 4. Whether this is a permanent thing or just being done for simplicity given that Booster 4 is only a prototype remains to be confirmed. Perhaps SpaceX did the math and figured that the aerodynamic profile of an extended fin isn't too dramatically different from a folded fin, or maybe the extra weight for a hinge system would negate the aerodynamic gain, or maybe the massive weight of the booster would be too much for a folding grin to support, or, or maybe, maybe, <laughs> SpaceX will have the fins rotated 90 degrees perpendicular to the ground to minimize the surface area for the ascent, since it's definitely confirmed that the fins can still rotate. I'm looking forward to seeing how this develops. Down at the business end of the booster, Elon posted this amazing shot of engineers hard at work on the plumbing that will distribute the fuel to the rocket's 29 Raptor engines. Elon later stated that what we're looking at here are only the primary fuel lines and that the secondary plumbing and all the wiring will represent a much greater challenge, but I'm sure SpaceX are up to the task. On the subject of Raptor engines, SpaceX announced on the 26th of July that they've now built their 100th Raptor, and celebrated with this photo of the team and of course the 100th Raptor itself. I'm sure you'd all join me in giving them a big congratulations. <laughs> of course, SpaceX are going to need all the Raptor engines they can get their hands on. They'll need 35 for the upcoming launch of Ship 20 and Booster 4, and given that both vehicles will end their journeys by splashing down into the salty ocean, I'm not too confident that their engines will be in a reusable state. I hope you're enjoying the eye candy on screen, by the way. It's a brand new render from Robos Bomb that will be dropping on his channel very soon. Follow the link in the description to make sure you're subscribed. And hey, if you're not subscribed to this channel, then make sure you hit that red button and ring the bell as well, as these videos are news videos after all, and therefore are best enjoyed on their day of upload for maximum relevance. And liking the video is a great way to support my channel as well, so that I can continue sharing these videos with you. I always do appreciate it. Once Booster 4 completes its leg of the journey, it's all up to Ship 20 to make it into space. Right at this moment, the vehicle is rapidly coming together, all sections are now accounted for, and the ship is currently sitting in the mid-bay, ready for final stacking. C. Nunez images got a great shot of the thermal protection tiles being added to its nose cone to help it withstand the absolutely insane re-entry speeds that it's going to be subjected to. Man, it's going to be so awesome seeing a flight-ready Starship again. I know we still get to see Ship 15 and 16 on the regular, but even though there's still a faint possibility possibility that Ship 16 will be used as a hypersonic test vehicle, I'd wager that SpaceX don't have any plans to fly these vehicles. Ship 20 though, that's a different story. I think the thing I'm most excited for right now 
it's just being able to bear witness to the sheer scale of the fully stacked Starship and Super Heavy vehicle. The absolutely massive Booster 3 has got us all hyped for seeing a fully built version of the world's most powerful rocket. Of course, in order to launch the world's most powerful rocket, SpaceX will need a launch table and a launch tower, described as so-called Stage Zero by Elon. And luckily, both of these things are moving at an equally speedy development pace. Last week, we saw the final stacking of the ninth and final segment of the launch tower, completing the structure's skeleton. Over the next few days, we'll see the addition of the booster catch and mounting systems, as well as the other guts that'll be needed to support the Starship launch. I imagine it's the systems designed to catch the rocket after flight that represents the hardest engineering challenge, and it'll certainly be interesting to watch this aspect of the tower materialize. Next to the tower is the orbital launch mount, which is what the rocket will sit on top of, and it's finally had the orbital launch table installed atop its pillars, bringing this structure one giant leap closer to completion. I know that I've probably only talked about a fraction of the happenings at Starbase this week. It was definitely quite overwhelming to try and sit down and place all the news into a coherent script, given the absolutely monstrous pace that SpaceX have stepped things up to. But for now, I think we've covered all the major events and happenings. Oh, actually, one thing I didn't mention was that we now have confirmation of what the payload will be for the first orbital flight. Elon has confirmed that it'll be a, uh, a wheel of cheese. So, not exactly a Tesla, but it's, uh, it's, it's something. And weirdly, isn't even the first time SpaceX have sent a wheel of cheese into space. <laughs> I'm going to close off Starship coverage there and move along to part two of the video. The other things we saw happen last week. <laughs> Gonna start this section off with a rundown of the three orbital rocket launches that we saw last week. The first took place on the 29th of July from the hills of China, specifically the Huiquan Satellite Launch Complex, where we saw a Long March 2D launch a Tianhui 1D Earth Observation Satellite into low Earth orbit. Next up, also on the 29th of July, we were pleasantly surprised with the return to flight of Rocket Lab's Electron. Rocket Lab saw a mission loss during their 20th Electron flight back in May this year, which caused the subsequent grounding of their rocket. The issue experienced in the mission was an unexpected shutdown moments after second stage ignition. Thankfully, Rocket Lab were eventually able to recreate the issue in testing and as such were able to implement a fix to stop it from happening again. Still, I'm sure things were a little bit tense when launching this rocket. The payload was a single satellite for the US Space Force for space weather monitoring and for technology demonstration. And I'm sure a big sigh of relief was had among the mission controllers when the second stage lit without issue and the payload successfully made it to low Earth orbit. Congratulations to Rocket Lab and welcome back. The third and final orbital launch was an Ariane 5 on the 30th of July, which launched two satellites from the French Guiana spaceport. Both satellites are for communications, one on behalf of Brazil and one on behalf of France, and both successfully made it to geosynchronous Earth orbit. It's good to see the Ariane 5 maintaining its reliability record. This rocket will be carrying the very exciting James Webb telescope into space later this year, which is a mission that nobody in the world wants to go wrong, so it's reassuring that the rocket seems up to the task of not exploding. <laughs> now we were hoping to see another launch last week, the second test flight of Starliner, Boeing's commercial crew capsule. However, this flight would have seen the Starliner head to the International Space Station to dock with the Harmony module, which wasn't possible during the planned window last week because the new Russian laboratory Nyoka arrived at the station on the 29th of July, one day before the Starliner launch and docked with the Svezda's Nadir port, marking the first major expansion of the Russian segment of the station in over two decades. Why is this relevant? Well, shortly after docking, the module began firing its engine thrusters in error, inducing a large spin effect on the station, causing the entire station to rotate over 45 degrees. Thankfully, the module's fuel eventually depleted, after which ground controllers could stop the rotation and return the station to its original orientation. NASA have confirmed that the crew of the station were never in danger, but the event was certainly dramatic to say the least. With all now stabilized and the Nyoka hatch open, hopefully the new launch date of Starline and we'll see no further delays. In other news last week, a report published by Ars Technica states that internal sources at Blue Origin have confirmed that they're working to make the upper stage of New Glenn fully reusable in order to bring down the cost of the rocket and to make it more competitive with Starship. This is in contrast to the original plans, which would have seen the new Glenn function more like a Falcon 9, where only the first stage is recovered. 
One can only assume that this change in direction is in response to the Starship program, which of course will recover the entire vehicle, first and second stage, and if Blue Origin want to stay competitive with SpaceX then, looking to make the new Glenn similarly fully reusable would make a lot of sense. The reusable upper stage would be stainless steel, much like Starship, and has apparently been dubbed Jarvis, allegedly after the artificial intelligence created by Tony Stark in the Marvel Universe. It'll be interesting to see if Blue Origin go down the rapid, open-to-the-world, back-to-back prototyping approach that SpaceX have taken, or if they'll continue their tradition of secrecy until the first flight tests. Who knows, but I imagine it'll be a while before we see anything. I mean, New Glenn is already years behind schedule, and we're yet to see a fully complete vehicle. New Glenn will initially begin its life with a Falcon 9 style expendable upper stage, and we can expect their new recoverable second stage to enter use in the mid 2020s. Competition is always good, and this should be exciting news for any space enthusiast, so I say good luck to the team at Blue Origin with Project Jarvis. You know, Jarvis in the Marvel world is an acronym. It stands for just a rather very intelligent system. I wonder if Blue Origin will have it stand for something. Maybe Jeff's adventure regarding valiantly imitating SpaceX. <laughs> I don't know, that was like the first idea I had. Leave your ideas down below. I think we can have some fun with this one. <laughs> anyway, New Glenn won't be launching anytime too soon, but there are some rockets that will be. Next week, in fact. Let's talk about that. <laughs> The first launch of the week will be tomorrow, on the 3rd of August, and will be the reattempt at launching the Boeing Orbital Flight Test 2 of Starliner, which, as we already discussed, was delayed from last week due to the mishaps on the ISS that would have disrupted the mission. Since all is now stabilised, all is good to go with the Starliner, and indeed the Atlas V rocket that will be launching it from Cape Canaveral. Starliner will be uncrewed for this flight, and we'll see it docked to the International Space Station's Harmony module, where, of course, a parking space has been cleared for it by Crew Dragon. It'll be interesting to see the two commercial capsules simultaneously docked to the station for sure. Provided this mission goes well, hopefully it won't be too long before we get to see people flying in the Starliner. And of course, hopefully we don't see any further unexpected engine firings with things docked to the ISS. <laughs> the second launch expected for the week will be on the 5th and will be from China. This will be a Long March 3BE, which will be carrying a ChinaSat 2E communication satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit. And those are the launches that we're expecting to see so far, but as you are all probably aware, things can often change with space flight, so we may get some surprise flights or, less happily, some surprise delays. Either way, that's all the things I wanted to cover for this part of the video, so time to wrap things up. And that's it for another Space News Rundown this week! I've changed the format of the show a little bit, obviously there's no history segment now, and we have some shiny new transition sounds and effects, hopefully you liked them. Personally, I think they look a lot nicer. Let me know either down below, or hit me up on social media, Twitter and Instagram at on screen, and I post stuff on those during the week, not just on Mondays and Saturdays. Or you could join one of my communities either on Reddit or Discord, share some spicy memes or something, if that's still the relevant term with the youth, I don't know. I'm 27, I don't, I don't, I don't empathise anymore, I'm old. And hey, if you wanted to support the channel even further, you can join by clicking the join button below the video, or donate to Patreon, a list of people that have done so are now scrolling past on screen. Uh, you can join Patreon using the description link or the link on screen. There are also two videos that are also from my channel that YouTube thinks you'll like, hopefully they are good picks. And that's, that's the video. I've said everything I needed to say. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on Saturday where we'll be launching a very special space shuttle in Kerbal Space Program.